new from the Embedded podcast. Female athletes have always needed grit and talent. But for decades, they've also needed a certificate. There was chit-chat about, is that really a woman? And even now, they're still being checked and questioned. Their story is the newest series from CBC and NPR's Embedded. It's called Tested. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You rely on this podcast to stay informed and connected with your local community. And we rely on you. Without listener support, this show simply wouldn't exist. Be a part of the team that makes this show possible by donating to our home, KUOW. It only takes a minute. Donate at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thank you. You're listening to Soundside. I'm Diana O'Pong. Have your friends been canceling on you because they're sick? Coworkers on prolonged absence because your entire team came down with a bug? Feeling a sniffle yourself a little lately? This summer, the CDC says more than a dozen states across the U.S. are seeing very high spikes in COVID cases. But now that we're a few years past the pandemic, what's the responsible amount of time to stay home from work, avoid the grocery store, or get the latest booster? To help answer those questions and get the latest in Covetiquette, I've got Dr. Amanda Casto with me. Dr. Casto is an infectious disease specialist with the University of Washington School of Medicine. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. So COVID rates are nowhere near the level seen at the height of the pandemic. What do we know now about the latest COVID infection in Washington? Um, so we do know that rates are going up as of July. Um, so we are we are seeing a new increase. So that's something that people should be aware of and that that's, uh, that they may have already encountered having uh, acquaintances that have uh, come down with COVID recently. What are some of the most common symptoms for recent variants? And how can people sort of suss out the difference between COVID and a more common cold? Um, so the symptoms really haven't changed that much over time. Um, the frequency of them, if you look across a lot of different people, have, have shifted around a little bit. Um, but the main symptoms are still fever, chills, fatigue. Um, sometimes people have something that they would think of as like brain fog and then having respiratory symptoms like shortness of breath or cough. And then there's kind of a smattering of other things like sinus congestion, sore throat. Um, some people do have gastrointestinal symptoms like nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. And so any of those and all of those can be COVID. And there's really no way to distinguish whether or not you have COVID or a cold based on symptoms. So it sounds like testing is the best way to figure out. Yeah. Is it a virus like COVID or is it just the common cold? It's the only way really to figure out. Uh, unfortunately, there's just no no way to know um, whether or not you have COVID or a cold because they can they can seem very similar, feel very similar to to an individual. During the pandemic, it was recommended that people quarantine and self-isolate for 14 days to make sure the virus was totally out of their system. How long do you recommend people self-isolate now or take that sick time to be sure that they're not contagious? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, this has changed a lot as we've learned more a lot about the virus. So the current recommendation from the CDC is if you are having symptoms, you should have a period of time that's 24 hours from when you've last had a fever and for which your your symptoms are consistently improving before you go back to work and your normal activities, before you come out of quarantine, which is essentially being at home and being away from people that you live with at home, um, if possible. So after that 24-hour period, you can go back to work, more of your normal activities, uh, the CDC does recommend that you take five more days after that 24-hour period in which you're a bit more cautious than you might usually be. Um, I would recommend wearing a mask during that time and potentially being a little bit more fastidious about doing things like washing hands and maybe staying away from uh, large groups of people. Um, and then after that five days, you can go back to your regular activities. Got it. So if you're still contagious, continue to self-isolate. And you mentioned masking. How long do you recommend people mask in public spaces? And is that still effective? It, it is definitely effective. It's a great way for people who are particularly vulnerable to protect themselves in public from getting infected. And it's just also a nice thing that you can do for your fellow citizen if you've um, had an infection recently. 
so again, I would recommend if you have improvement in your symptoms and you're able to come out of quarantine, that you take that five day period at least to mask in public places. You can certainly mask longer if you're more comfortable doing that, um, or if you still have some residual symptoms left. But uh, I would recommend at least the five days um, after you've come out of quarantine to continue to mask in public. And there isn't much, if any, public testing these days. There was a you know big movement for that during the height of the pandemic. Yeah. I've heard from people who just buy, you know, from Walgreens tests that they can use. Do you have a recommended place for listeners to find reliable COVID tests? And are there any that folks should stay away from that you know of? So I don't know of any in particular that people should stay away from. And it is it is true that public testing, it's much more difficult to find now. Um, so just to be clear, there are two types of COVID tests. One is the rapid test that you can buy it's an antigen test, um, if you see that described either um, in the news or, or on the box. And these are really good tests to rule in whether you have COVID. So if they're positive, then you probably do have COVID. However, they're not as sensitive, so they do miss some cases compared to uh, what we call a, a NAT test or a, a nucleic acid amplification test. And so these are really the gold standard tests, um, but they're not ones that you can go and buy in a store. You have to either go to your doctor's office or to like a hospital. And so you may be referred to that to uh, confirm whether or not you have COVID. So keeping in mind that there are two types of tests and sort of two levels of, of certainty, um, whether or not uh, the, the test is positive. Um the, the places now that you can go in addition to just buying a test are mostly pharmacies. Also in, in kind of the local area, you can go to a, a Quest diagnostic. And then of course you can always go to your primary care doctor's office. They usually have laboratory or testing sites. You may not need like a full appointment to come in to test. Got it. And let's talk about vaccination. The CDC recommends that everyone five years and older gets an updated COVID-19 vaccine. How often do you recommend listeners get a booster shot? Yeah, so we still haven't really gotten to a place where we're not expecting like vaccination recommendations to continue to change, if that makes sense. Um, so I think people do need to stay aware to what of what the current recommendations are. And the current recommendations are if you're age five to 64, that you have one of the updated uh, COVID vaccinations. And so just to be clear, the, these updated vaccines came out in September of last year. So if you received one vaccination since then and you're age five to 64, um, then you are up to date. Um, if you're older than 64, um, we recommend that those individuals actually get two vaccinations, um, two of the updated versions. Uh, of the COVID vaccine um, at least four months apart. So if you are five to 64 and you've gotten vaccinated once since, since September of 2023, again, you're up to date. And what about the flip side? Not everyone wants to or can get vaccinated. So I'm curious to know what, if any, alternatives people can try or ask their primary care doc about when it comes to protecting themselves um, or treatment for COVID. Yeah, unfortunately, other than the vaccine, um, that's that's really the best way um, to to prevent COVID. Other than that, you kind of have to just return to sort of behavioral interventions like staying away from people, isolating, masking, hand washing. Yeah, that those kinds of things. the The vaccine works really well, and I would definitely, if cost is an issue, if accessibility is an issue, there are a lot of great resources online, this on the CDC website, um, where where you can look into that further um, and, and potentially get access to a vaccine. But yeah, if you can't be vaccinated, and then also we have people who, for which the vaccine, um, because of their immune systems, doesn't work as well as we would like to, um, you're really back to just those, those behavioral interventions. And I heard that there's a nasal version. I don't know if that's out and still effective. Um, and also, is there going to be a new vaccine this fall? Um, so there certainly may be a new vaccine this fall. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we haven't really gotten to a place yet where 
vaccination recommendations are expected to stay sort of consistent over the long term. So that's why people should be um, aware of any new vaccines coming up and any new uh, recommendations. So we, we definitely may have an updated version um, this fall because the virus is always changing. Right now, the three vaccines that are recommended in the U.S. are all injection vaccines, the Moderna, the Pfizer, and the, the Novavax. Um, and so those are the three that are currently currently approved. So one of the longstanding enigmas with COVID-19 is long COVID. People who had symptoms past those 14 initial days or who never shook symptoms at all. What do we know about long COVID today and what are treatment options for folks who are suffering from it? Yeah, so long COVID is an area of very active research um, and we have learned some things, um, but there's still many things that we don't know. I'm I'm currently working on a study now with the University of Washington where we're we're seeing um, whether or not a particular uh, medication is effective um, for for long COVID symptoms, um, and there's just many 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 other studies um, that are are looking at this. Uh, unfortunately, we still don't really understand why it happens and why it affects some people um, and not others. Um, it has been noticed that rates have gone down um, with time. Uh, we think this is either due to a change in the genetics of the virus um, or because of um, vaccination. So, you know, we don't, however, have a proven treatment yet. Um, many, many things are being tried, but but not yet. Um, so I would just really emphasize that the best way to prevent long COVID is to prevent getting COVID, um, which is with vaccination. Or uh, we also see that if you get treatment for COVID, for instance, with uh, Paxlovid, um, the rates of long COVID seem to be uh, to be lower, um, and and for those suffering with long COVID, um, I it, it it's a very long road. It's very difficult, um, but it, although the result, although the rates of it vary from study to study, we have seen that a significant portion of people over time do either get better or their symptoms do ultimately resolve. Um, again, we don't we don't know exactly why. Um, but um, for anybody with long COVID, I would I would just stay tuned because I think that there's going to be a lot more information coming out in this space. A lot more to learn, a lot more research to be done to try to help folks. Dr. Amanda Casto is an infectious disease specialist with the University of Washington School of Medicine. Thanks so much for talking to me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to SoundSide. And hey, this show is only possible because listeners support us. If you are able to give right now, check out the show notes for a link to donate. And don't forget, you can listen live on KUOW 94.9 FM Seattle at noon and 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday or anytime online at KUOW.org.